a massive 3.5 square mile estate, housing research facilities for 23,000 employees. This is Huawei's newest campus in Dongguan, south of China. Inspired by European landmarks, drawing attention and talent from around the world. Called the Oxhorn Campus, its sheer size symbolizes Huawei's growing influence as the largest telecom equipment manufacturer, the second biggest smartphone maker in the world, an icon that represents China's technological might. But Huawei is facing its biggest crisis in three decades, embroiled in the US-China trade war, facing claims from the US government that it poses a national security threat. In May, Huawei was put on a US trade blacklist, banning American firms from selling components and services to the telecoms giant, accusing it of providing a backdoor for Chinese intelligence services, something Huawei denies. Caught between the battle of two superpowers, between the battle of technologies, China's Huawei is fighting to survive the crisis. In this episode of Managing Asia, I meet up with Ren Fei, CEO and founder, for the latest in his battle plans to tackle his biggest challenge yet. It's been six months since Huawei was put on the US entity list. It was May 16th. Do you remember the day? What was the first thing that went through your mind? Were you angry? Were you, were you disappointed? When I heard that the US had put us on the entity list, I wasn't very surprised because we were mentally prepared. When they had just started cracking down on us, we estimated our sales would drop sharply, but I did not believe it will endanger our survival. One or two months later, during an interview, I said that our estimated drop in revenue might be around 30 billion US dollars. That estimation was made based on our sales plan for this year, not the revenue for last year. As time goes by, we are fully confident that this drop won't exceed $10 billion, compared with our plan for this year. The impact on us will be much smaller than expected. You actually put out a memo that said the company was facing a live or die moment. As CEO, what was the first thing you did to manage the crisis at Huawei? First of all, this incident was not a surprise to any of our senior management. We are all of one mind. We need to change our employees' mindset, as we are not in peacetime anymore. We need to switch. For more than 30 years, our employees have been very well off, which is another way to say slacking off. We must take this opportunity to prevent our employees from slacking off. Second, during peacetime, our products were advanced and superior, which allowed many mediocre employees to move into managerial positions. These employees were eloquent and knew how to flatter their bosses, so other employees may feel that they were promoted without being tested in the field. For this reason, we need to remove these mediocre managers. This is the idea in my mind. This idea will be made public, which will sound an alarm to our employees. This way, some of these employees may correct their behavior, choose to resign or retire. This will allow the company to weed out mediocrity. Within three to five years, we will see vitality among our employees. Looking at the last six months, what were some of the painful lessons learned for you and Huawei. I can summarize the painful lesson in one sentence. We must not slack off or allow mediocrity, and we must remain dedicated and inspire passion throughout the organization. The U.S. has granted a temporary reprieve to allow Huawei to continue buying components from the U.S. To what extent have you managed to resume the supply of components from the U.S.? 
The US government didn't approve a single request for license during the first 90-day reprieve. When they extended the license validity by another 90 days, they added over 60 of our affiliates that they had initially overlooked to the entity list. They've actually increased their sanctions on us, rather than being more lenient. And in August, you launch your own operating system called the Hongmen OS, and you're now developing your own advanced chipset called Ascent 910. How much progress have you made to drive Huawei to be more self-reliant? First of all, we want to delegate the decision-making power to our experts. The last thing we want is to have bureaucrats or managers lead our way in technology. So we've decided that our managers should do administrative affairs and leave technology-related decisions to experts. The Hongmen OS was originally designed for IoT. Whether it will be able to support the future development of Huawei, the key is not the operating system itself. Creating an operating system is relatively simple. The critical factor is establishing an ecosystem, and this requires the cooperation of tens of thousands of companies. This is very complicated and needs a long time to develop. Let's talk about creating that ecosystem that you talked about. The Hongman operating system, which I understand it can be used across different devices, but no plans yet to use on smartphones. Do you think that Hongman has the potential to replace Google's Android should you choose to develop it as an alternative operating system for your smartphone business? We won't replace Android operating system because we support the development of Android. Google is a very good company and we want to enhance cooperation with them. If Hongmen gets to develop its ecosystem, it will be a good complement instead of a replacement. I understand you want to keep your relationship with Google, but does Hongmen OS have the potential to replace Android Google, should you choose to develop it further as an alternative mobile operating system? First of all, we want to strengthen our partnership with Google, and Google wants that too. The only problem is if the US government won't approve it. Whether we have the approval depends on what happens on November the 19th. We hope that the US will approve our continued friendly cooperation with Android. I'm sure it's not about capability, as we are definitely capable of achieving what we want to do. For now, you've gone ahead anyway, and you've launched your latest handset, the Mate 30, even though you don't have the full suite of Google Apps. Why do it? Why launch a new handset in the midst of all this uncertainty? For the Mate 30, it has a lot of functions that would attract many customers. Whether people could accept our product without the pre-installed Android system, I need to test. They expect the number of Mate 30 sold to be around 20 million sets. Let's wait and see if people are actually willing to pay for our Mate 30 without the full Android system, whether people can still accept us. Just out of curiosity, did you bother to test Hongmen on Mate 30? Not for now. Inside Huawei's highly secure research center, things are hardly slowing down. When you hear of the crisis that Huawei's going through outside with the US, how do you feel as an engineer working here? Yeah, I think um, I don't worry about it. The tech giant is in fact ramping up R&D. Engineers showed us a state-of-the-art antenna testing lab for 5G equipment and other patented research. On the left one is the old technology. It is an aluminum alloy. And this one is the technology we developed for 5G products. It's more than 30% lighter. It is made of a magnesium alloy. Oxford PhD holder Chun Cheng Gong specializes in structural materials to make 5G equipment lighter and more durable. Thermal engineer Tianhua Zhou showed me a technology to cool down 5G base stations. We have a name, but uh, you know, the, the composition is uh, quite complicated. Yeah. So and it's a uh, secret? 
It's kind of secret, to be honest, it's kind of secret. So it's a Huawei secret? Yeah, we have the patent, yeah. Perhaps more interesting was what they couldn't show me. 5G is open to you. So it means 5G cooling technology. It's old technology. So you already started on 6G? Yeah, actually we're working on 6G. 5G is 1,000 more. And 6G may be 2,000 or 3,000 watts, so we need new technology. So we're working on that. It's Huawei's 5G technology that has been at the center of the storm. And I'm going to do a speed test so you can see the speed difference between 4G and 5G. So you can see the 4G phone is 88 megabits per second, and the 5G phone is 900 megabits per second, almost one gigabit. 5G's faster speed enables new technologies such as self-driving cars, AI and robotics. But the US has slapped a trade blacklist on the tech giant, citing security risks and pressing its allies to follow suit. When you hear your CEO and founder, uh, uh -huh. Ren Zhengfei, uh -huh. say that this is a live or die moment for the company, as an engineer, uh -huh. does it drive you to be more innovative? Yes, I think so, yes. Um, uh, I, think, I kind of feel it's uh, my responsibility to, to work hard, not only for myself, but also make a little contributions to, to our country. It's a critical moment for China's development. Zhou so said founder Ren Zhengfei called these laboratories 2012. It is because the famous disaster movie 2012. Mr. Uh, Ren Zhengfei asked if Huawei's 2012 years coming, who can help us? 2012 lab is Huawei's North Arc. So and that we, arc is going to help save the company? Yeah, to save our, our company. But is Huawei hardy enough to survive the turmoil? Ren says he's toughening up the company from the inside out. After this crisis happened, we're marching faster along the road of innovation. When hiring, we pay more attention to scientists and young talents. So we are much more capable to develop new products than in the past. Not only will we make up for the loss created by the US and continue with our production, but we will also update ourselves in technological development. These should happen at the same time. You often refer Huawei to a broken airplane. What would it look like three to five years from now? Within two years, our plane will be completely repaired. In three years, you will see a new plane. It would probably have more advanced engines to fly faster. I think the whole restructuring within the organization should be completed within three to five years. We would have a higher level of efficiency by then. Our ability to develop products and world-leading technology would be significantly enhanced. And for our whole service system, our projects around the world and our manufacturing system, the use of AI would increase dramatically. We should say the plane would become stronger. Will it fly faster than any other plane in the world? Should be. It should be. I've been talking to your engineers in Dongguan, and they say work has already begun on 6G. What sort of progress have you made on 6G development? What sort of investment are you throwing in? We started work on 6G three to five years ago. We didn't just start it. I don't know the exact amount, but we are generous in our investment. But do you have the confidence that Huawei will lead in 6G as well? Yes. Trade talks are ongoing between the U.S. and China. And of course, Huawei has been used as a bargaining chip. Now, I understand that you don't want China to make concessions for you. Why put the future of Huawei and possibly that of your order on the line more than you should have to? Perhaps the U.S. believes this will serve them better in negotiations or talks, but we don't want to sacrifice national interests for ourselves. 
National interest is about the poor and their products. We are already well off. We cannot ask the poor people to save us. So we think we should just withstand these blows from the US, and we will resort to legal means to resolve this problem. Are you watching the impeachment process that Donald Trump is facing in the US? Do you think this could complicate matters for Huawei in the US? I haven't paid attention to Trump's impeachment inquiry. I think Trump is quite a good president. He didn't lead the US to a tougher situation. What's not good about that? To what extent would it have implications on Huawei's position in the US? Would it change the US position on Huawei? We don't have any kind of status in the US, and we don't plan to. We're not interested whether he's re-elected or not. This has nothing to do with us. Do you think if he does face impeachment process and it does go through, a Democratic government under Joe Biden or Elizabeth Warren would actually open the doors for Huawei to be removed from the entity list? You think that's possible? I don't think so. Who would speak up for Huawei? No one. So you think that Huawei will stay on the blacklist for some time? Yes, I believe so. Is that your expectation? Yes. You're not hopeful at all that it will be removed from the blacklist? Yes, there isn't much hope. So that's a scenario you're going with. That's the assumption you're operating on, that you will continue to stay on the blacklist and you will continue to operate as Huawei would and you would continue to take steps to survive this crisis that you're in. We want to remain open-minded and keep pursuing economic globalization. Even if we're not taken out of the entity list, for some American companies, the things they sell are not important. Why can't they sell them? Only a very small portion of U.S. products are related to security. If you prevent all companies from selling to foreign countries, this is not beneficial to the U.S. Should the ban be lifted one day, we would still buy from these companies. Let's talk about your daughter. She's under house arrest in Canada. A hearing is now ongoing about the legality of her arrest in Vancouver. Are you hopeful that she will be acquitted soon? We need to wait for the court decision in Canada. I don't know what decision they will reach. Have you spoken to her recently? How is she holding up? We made some phone calls. We chatted and I listened to her, what she thinks, the books she read, the TV shows she watched, even going out for hot pot. I only hope she can relax and be prepared for the long run. Nothing much else. Is she anything like you in terms of resilience and resolve? I feel that none of my three children resembles me. None of them liked me or talked to me much. In the past, they didn't talk to me at all. Now it's slightly better. We have some communication, but still very little. The reason is, when they were little, I devoted my time to work. I never took care of them or played with them. So we didn't have much emotional connection. Perhaps that's why they are independent and strong. When you're more independent, you rely less on your parents. So my children don't talk to me much, not just Meng Wang Zhou. But looking at what she's going through right now, has it brought the two of you closer as a result? This might have helped us bring us closer. If she comes back one day, we can sit down regularly to have meals. She can feel she's needed and feel the warmth of the family. It has helped, yes. We don't intend to license our technology to all Western companies. We'll license it to only one Western company. We'll give it an exclusive license so that there will be a large market for them. We think this company should be a US company. Europe already has its own 5G technology, so do South Korea and Japan. They just need to make some improvements and adjustments to its development. Since the U.S. doesn't yet have any 5G technology, we should exclusively license it to a U.S. company.
but essentially this opens up the opportunity for another Western company to be a giant competitor to you. Are you willing to accept the fact that you might lose your 5G leadership? First, we will get a lot of money from the licensing. That will be like adding firewood to fuel our innovation on new technologies. It will mean that we will have a better chance of maintaining our leading position. Secondly, we will bring in a strong competitor. This will prevent our 190,000 employees from becoming complacent. They'll know that if they sleep on the job, they might wake up and find they have lost their jobs. It's simply not enough for me to keep pushing our employees to work hard every day. Sheep become stronger when they're chased by wolves. I don't worry that a strong competitor will emerge and drag Huawei down. In fact, I would be happy to see that, because that would mean that the world is becoming stronger. And finally, I want to ask you, Mr. Ren, you're a visionary here in China. You grew Huawei to be the biggest telecom equipment maker in the country, the second biggest maker when it comes to smartphones. How would you describe your leadership and your management style? My management style is characterized by compromise. I'm not a demanding person who insists that all things be done according to my instructions. I speak my mind. If anyone objects to it, I am open to revising my ideas. After the revision, they'll need to put it into practice. This process is defined by compromise. It's not a time to stubbornly cling to my own viewpoint, because there are many aspects of technology, management and finance that I don't understand. I need to listen to everyone's views and integrate them into my decision making. So the decisions we implement are the results of compromise between many parties. So what drives you? What motivates you? What keeps you going? On compromise, I actually am compromising with the US. I'm actually pro-American. I had requested my company not to mass produce many of our advanced technologies, but produce them on a small scale. However, after we are added to the entity list, I didn't suppress those technologies anymore. So our 5G standalone network, Atlas computing platform, Ascend chips, and Taishan servers all came out. That is not an accident. It is because I used to suppress them in the past and didn't allow them to come out. But in fact, they've been in the works for more than 10 years. Compromise inside the company makes us united, and compromise with the outside world creates a favorable environment. Why did we not panic when we were added to the entity list? Because we were fully prepared a long time ago. We could just switch to our own products. Of course we have to undergo a run-in period. But I don't worry much about whether the company can survive or operate smoothly. Have you ever thought about the legacy you want to leave behind? I don't need to leave anything behind. When people are gone, they become dust, so there's nothing to leave behind. How do you want to be remembered? <laughs> I hope people will forget me. It's a waste to remember me. I hope they can stop thinking about me. If they remember me and turn this into a game to see who is more loyal, that will turn into a burden. They can look into the sky when they remember me. I don't want them to think about me, and it's too tiring for them to remember me. Mr. Ren, thank you so much for talking to me on Managing Asia. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.